Thank you. I'll call to, uh, oh, okay, that was a good bye. Um, I'll call to order the January 12th meeting of the Public Affairs Committee and take a moment uh, just to express sorrow uh, at the passing of Mark McDonald. Uh, he's the retired public works supervisor uh, and over 35 year employee of the township. Uh, send our condolences to his family as well as to his colleagues remaining in the township. Um, Mark was full of energy and warmth and he'll be remembered fondly. I'll jump into item one. Any comments or questions from the board? Okay, I actually have questions on each of those items or comments. Um, in terms of the property maintenance, I uh, just wanna thank uh, Alan Brown uh, for his um, actual tours that he gave to the students at the high school engaged in problem-based learning um, back in December. Um, they were short and sweet, but very informative. And uh, the students are really doing a great job. And I wanna thank him for um, being so helpful. Uh, in terms of the public information, um, we got a memo today, today, yesterday, I'm not sure, um, about phase one of the launch. Does anybody, of the new website, uh, does anybody want to pick that up or should I just summarize it real quick? All right, just uh, for, oh, there you are. Go ahead. I was going to say, and it's all yours. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right. Well, um, my understanding is that the new website will uh, be live uh, January 23rd uh, or around there, and a survey piece will accompany it and will come out separately as well. So the idea is it's not supposed to disrupt anybody. We wish you all good luck. We know you've been working on it. So thank you. Um, and in terms of parks and rec, I know some of us, many of us have been um, receiving emails and calls uh, with the uh, retirement of Mr. Henson uh, and concerns about uh, the continuity of the programming for uh, uh, parks and rec. So Mr. Manager, I, I know you're uh, willing to talk to that uh, commitment to Parks and Rec. So would you take it from there? Sure. Um, I just want to recognize Kelly Rebitz. She's done a nice job of uh, picking up the ball and going with it, uh, maintaining the programs. Uh, unfortunately, we were scheduled to meet yesterday, but uh, she is out with COVID now. So as soon as she returns, we will uh, be meeting, uh, getting letters sent out, um, to uh, returning uh, staff members, uh, especially lifeguards, um, to let them know we'd like them back. Um, I know I spoke with Chris today. Uh, we're going to be getting the pricing for pool painting, pool repairs, the deck. Um, I know that we've got to change the filter stand. Uh, typically, filter stand lasts between two and three years. Uh, it hasn't been changed at least in 22 years. So uh, we will be changing that to get the effectiveness of the pool uh, in the filtration system going. Um, so uh, we'll be also discussing plans uh, for um, the coming seasons. I know that um, Kelly has been working with the music uh, committee there to get ready and make selections for the music in the park series. Um, so. We may bump along a little bit here in the interim process, but uh, if there's any concerns or questions, please let me know, let Kelly know, Allison, Ashley, Lauren, anybody. Uh, if it's a park maintenance issue, Chris, uh, Bo, um, and Bob Dominic, uh, they do a great job. So reach out to all of them and uh, we'll keep moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll take uh, a motion to receive. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, item two for public affairs, receipt of the advisory committee meeting minutes. Any discussion by the board? 
Okay, I do uh, have a comment. Uh, following up on the Historical Commission um, uh, minutes, uh, the question is um, who actually is in charge of the Zoom capability for our advisory committees? Uh, Ashley and Allison and Lauren handle those. If there's any situations or issues with those, um, they can reach out to them. Okay, so uh, Dr. Wachowski um, has apparently been handling the Zoom um, connections on his own and had to upgrade uh, to the longer than 40 minute quota. So he was asking for reimbursement and I think that has not yet happened. Um, was, was that authorized? He was, and was that, authorized? Pardon? was that authorized or did he just do that preemptively? Because I mean, well, that, I, did, I did it for the commissioners several years ago, not expecting the reimbursement because I knew we were going to need it and I just did it and that's fine. But if he's on a committee and decided to do this and then say, by the way, I went out and bought something, now pay me for it. Not a real good procedure. Well, that we doesn't do, seem to, to be what he was saying. Yeah, yeah we do ahead. have capability for all of our um, citizen committees to use our Zoom. So um, whoever is the staff liaison should be coordinating with Ashley, Lauren, or myself to set them up. Okay, well, that, that apparently didn't happen. Uh, so he, they had to be doing it virtually themselves. So, um, and I know he had spoken with staff liaison prior and was going to be getting reimbursement, but that staff member is no longer uh, around. So uh, it's in the minutes, it's there for follow-up. And if somebody would please reach out and resolve that, that would be helpful. It's, and it's how, much is, the minutes. how much are we talking about? I don't know, but it was it was agreed to by the staff that he spoke to. Okay, no, I'm not disputing it, that. I, I, I yeah, would imagine it's sound, a fairly small amount. It used to yeah, be I, it used to be a hundred dollars. I know they raised it. I don't know where it is now. Okay. And again, I think it, it, it came about because nobody had that or offered that capability. So, and okay, if you could just you. have have that person reach out to Allison and she'll okay. get that, get that taken care of. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, okay, um, any other comments or questions? Okay, uh, motion to receive the committee minute. All those in favor of receiving the committee meeting minutes say aye. 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 Item number three, receipt of staff meeting minutes. Any comments? I'll move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, new business. Anne, you switched to mute for some reason. Goodness, sorry about that. Thank you. We didn't hear um, you. I was wondering, I said new business and- <laughs> New business that went quiet. Just Discussion with the Cheltenham Library System on the no smoking recommendation on library property. And Ms. Moran, thank you for waiting out uh, the first couple hours tonight. I appreciate you making time for me on the agenda this evening. Um, over the years that I've been with the library system, we've had a number of requests from both patrons and staff asking whether we can make our library campuses smoke and tobacco free. And um, when I had inquired about this a few years ago of library administration, I was informed that since they were township properties, the township would have to be involved in that decision. And uh, now that I am library administration, I'm coming to you this evening um, to find out how we can make this possible. Um, I'm not sure what the process would be. Um, I have some model templates that I would like to propose to my library board um, about this, but I wanted to get the permission and the procedure from the township before I move forward. I think Mr. President. Yeah. Yes. Do, um, I'm assuming whether, uh, Ann, whether you know or Bob, um, do we have a policy township-wide for our township 
properties as far as smoking. I was pretty sure in our in our parks that there's no smoking, but is is there a no smoking policy elsewhere in the township? Not that I'm aware of. Um, honestly, I can't say I've seen any signs that says no smoking in any particular areas. Um, Chris Allison. I was gonna say the only thing I'm aware of is um, playground areas. We know I know we have those signs, but I'm, yeah, I'm not sure the other uh, buildings. Uh, Bob, yeah, there are Bob, signs on the playground. Yeah, Bob, yeah. several years ago. I looked into it with some solicitors from the city of Philadelphia and the state uh, because I was looking to see if there'd be a way we could put an, a, a non-vaping capability in to keep it away from the schools and other public buildings. Uh, and there is various ordinances and things out there, but we never instituted anything here in the township as far as smoking. That's a good point, Brad, because um, I can get some legislation that incorporates exactly that. The vaping was left off. so. Uh, if the board would like, I'll go ahead and get a copy of that uh, legislation. And let me ask you, it's, there is no smoking allowed in township facilities. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. But, but we're, this is the issue of the whole campus. So that is the question. Um, how fast do we, um, so, so that we can entertain um, the library's request, how fast do we think we might be able to see such a model policy? Next week. That would be great. And I'll get, I'll get it to uh, Ed Diazio to uh, change the verbiage in there to, uh, for us and then the board can actually take a look at it and review. Um, but I would guess Mary Kay would probably wanna run that past her board first. Yeah, so I, I I think the idea was to share it with with you all with, with the library system. You said you already have some templates for for that, and you're just looking for the townships. Um, okay, so I, it sounds like we're going to be working on these simultaneously, right? Does that sound like the directive the board is giving? Yeah, I think it makes sense because if Bob comes back with something that is a little bit more broad uh it's only to the library's advantage mm -hmm. so we should see what, what comes out of it okay yeah i, I think i think it's a I th be because it's outside of the library building itself i think it probably has uh is more appropriate coming from the the township oh, sure. than 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 the libraries themselves particularly from an enforcement point of view as well so but okay. thank you mary Kay. i think it's an excellent idea Thank you. Okay, uh, we're set on that one, ready to move on. Thank you very much. Um, item 4B, uh, we're asked to consider approval of a change order in the amount of $4,375 to H and K Group for emergency stream, stream bank stabilization and sediment relocation work on Tucane Creek Parkway uh, near Melrose Country Club for a total of total now of eighty one thousand three hundred and eighty four dollars. Um, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Cool or um, Mr. Phillips wants to take this uh, and just give us the update, and, and then I see that there's more uh, questions. Yeah, I, I I can take this. Uh, this was the project that was completed uh, towards the end of December. It was the damage to the stream bank as a result of the hurricane. Um, it was done under an emergency uh, contract, if you recall. And when during the construction, there was we found uh, some subsurface conditions that weren't as anticipated. And basically, we had to put we had to move the wall a little bit in towards the creek and add uh, additional concrete behind the wall to solidify the uh, the stream bank and the and Tucany Creek Parkway. And that's what this is. It's in the amount of uh, $4,375. The original contract was $77,000. Right. And we saw the change order a couple of weeks ago, I think. Madam Chairperson? Okay. Yes. Commissioner um, Sigmundfeld, go ahead. Uh, Roger, was this the, um, the Tookany Creek Parkway washout that was the 300 yards south of Ashmead Road? That was number 30. I'm going to get wonky on this, but no. that was number 35 on the project. No, list. no, so it wasn't. Not, it's different. 
this was this was something that came up as a result of the hurricane that that Chris and his forces noticed once the water went down. Uh, if you'd like, I have a few pictures to show you. I think I could uh, explain. I think this I've seen quickly. the pictures. Or, of, you know, what, were in the packet, the right? They yeah, were in the, the agenda. The, the final yeah. product was in the packet, but the what packet. what had happened was during the during the hurricane. There was so what, Chris? Approximately four feet of water on Tiffany Creek Parkway. Uh, yes. It was, it was, it was pretty deep. And when the water subsided, the stream bank, the stream had actually moved, relocated itself in the channel, and it blew out a portion of the stream bank adjacent to, to Tiffany Creek Parkway. Um, so what this project did was was relocate the stream bank back, or solidify the stream bank and relocate the stream, the main channel to be a straighter run through. And that's what's shown in the pictures in the packet. That's the, the final product of that. And uh, if, if you notice in the pictures that where the, the grass and dirt line is and where the big, the big stone, the R5s and the R6s uh, start to solidify the stream bank, that original wall was supposed to be a few feet closer to the roadway. And when they started to do the construction, all that area started to collapse and it was really, uh, uh, not stable. So again, we moved the wall out a little bit towards the center of the creek, a few feet, and it took additional concrete. It was 35 additional yards of concrete. Well, we need to add some other stream bank stabilization in that area as part of the whole stormwater remediation uh, thing, or, or has that solved the problem permanently? This solved the problem for this specific area that was okay. corrected. You could... Uh, you Until could, the next hundred year storm. You, you could make repairs to that <laughs> stream Thursday. bank from this spot as far upstream as you want to go and as much money as you want to spend because this happens all over. With sure. that. Well, I know that's why I'm raising it to make sure that if it needs to be included in an expanded list of projects, you know, that would make sense. There is, there's a number of places that we've identified that are on that list you refer to, Mitch. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is also being submitted to FEMA for reimbursement, possible reimbursement under the, the uh, with the assistance of uh, the EMS coordinator. So I have a couple of questions, but Mr. Kluhl, I think I saw your fingers up. Did you well, want to add something? Was, yeah, that was one of the points I just wanted to make sure you knew is that we were submitting this to FEMA for reimbursement. We've already had the discussions with FEMA. It is on their hit list for reimbursement. Uh, I think one of the big criteria was if we put it back, what they call in kind, or do we make mitigation efforts to make it better? You know, so this would probably be a mitigation because we did a little bit different than uh, actually in kind. There's other discussions that will happen down the road to talk to the mitigation people to get the extra funds. So even though we're asking for the change or at this time above and beyond what we originally said, uh, we would anticipate that if everything goes well and the smittles go through with Kim and all, that we'll get, you know, 100 percent of this back into our pockets. Oh. I also wanted to mention, Mitch, that uh, the 300 uh, yards south of the Ashmi Road Bridge, which I think you were talking about. Yeah. If, if I recall, and Roger, you can correct me if I'm wrong, just uh, just north of this, about. 25 30 yards was that head wall remember that washed out we did some preliminary work so i think that was maybe something that uh we were looking to add in down the road mitch which would it's i think it's already recorded in there uh, as some work for down the road wasn't ida uh in particular but you know we noticed that after ida we saw a little hole on the road we saw it was washed out but we can't um say it was from Ida. So yeah, I just want to make sure that you knew that point as well. That was taken care of. I was out there myself. Uh, the contractor did a great job. Um, you know, I watched every level of the con concrete box go up pretty much the cement being poured. And uh, even though it's not on the invoice, they did some extra work for the township that uh, I asked them for uh, in particular, just while they were down there to remove some stuff that we couldn't get to that we would have had to pay um crane operators and stuff to get some stuff removed out there so they did some favors uh so you know h and k did some great work for the township so great. I mean, thank you people knew that that's good to know and reassuring if we were going to get reimbursed my my questions um were actually prompted by the the photographs that you submitted in the 
in the agenda packets, because when I think of stream bank stabilization, I also uh, think about vegetation and deep mm -hmm. roots. And what surprised me or what, what I saw in the pictures, and you guys have been on the field in the field, so you know better than perhaps the glimpse that those photographs revealed. But what I saw um, was that there were trees in the other areas of the, and I don't know, perhaps there were trees here too that, that were knocked over into the creek. Um, but it struck me that right across the street is a wide open, grassy golf course. And there's just nothing to hold up the road. It looked more like a road reconstruction stabilization than it was a creek restabilization. And um, I do wonder to what extent the lack of vegetation in the golf course played into the destruction and the flooding at that point and the, the washing away of the road. And to what extent without serious vegetation in that area, we're just asking for the same problem, uh, just maybe a little, little further into the distance because of concrete, but, um, but is that really sustainable? So I'm, I'm asking that as a question and what other, um, you know, if, if there's similar situations, what we do about them. My, my understanding is that most of the um, stabilization projects that are engineered are not to give the creek a straightaway, but to wind it in and out of, you know, the sort of like the hairpin turns uh, kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll shut up now and let you guys answer. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make an attempt at answering the, uh, some of those questions that you just posed there. The, the impetus of this project originally was what you just said was a stabilization of the roadway. The top of the creek bank where it failed uh, was approximately two to three feet away from the white stripe on the paving. When right. We went out and noticed that. And it was... Uh, Allison, if, can you can you let me share my screen quickly? And I, I want to share a before picture. Uh, I'm not sure that everyone has seen these. Uh, can everyone see this picture here? So, so, and to your point, was there vegetation there? There was vegetation there that walked away. Or that, that washed away. Uh, you can see where the gentlemen here in the, in the vests are. This is not even two feet from the edge of the road. Uh, here's another view of it. And you can see this, this portion of the creek, how it, it winds, like you say, along the creek bank. This creek bank was probably 15, 20 feet out towards the creek before it failed. And all of this crescent-shaped area washed away. Uh, and you can see how deep it is. That's probably about 12 to 15 feet down to the bottom of the creek. Uh, so what was done was that was all, the creek bag was all reconstructed and solidified so that we didn't have any issues with the roadway falling in. And uh, the creek, the, the deposition of solids in this area, what happened from when you get a, an S-turn winding of a creek on the inside of that S-turn, during high flooding events, that's where the sediment settles and it gets worse and worse and builds it up and it will start restricting the creek and it points it towards a, a creek bank such as this, which creates the failure. Uh, so what we did, number one on this project was to solidify the roadway so that we did not lose the road. Here's another view of, of how this part right here at the creek where my arrow is, down to here used to be a straight line and the creek moved over towards the roadway and deposited all of these solids that don't have grass there so what was done that was all pulled back towards the bank and the bank was solidified um, and and this is the final product of, of how we 
we solidified that so that the, there was no more danger to the road. These these orange barriers are in the same place as they were uh, in the other pictures. And we took the, the all of the, the sediment that was laid in the middle of the creek and pulled it back. And, and this is why when people make property moves without a permit, we run into problems. Whole Creek move didn't have a permit. So we had to fix it. A little humor interjected in the right. project. So, so and, and to your point, there are other types of projects uh, when you talk about stream bank stabilization that will involve vegetation. Uh, this, this was not one where that would have been applicable. This, this, was, this was one that you, you're correct. It's more of a roadway stabilization than it was a creek bank stabilization. I got you. Uh, is there, do you see any uh, value I mean, down where the stream behaved better in your in the photograph you just showed us, there were trees as opposed to just brush. Do you see any value in some serious tree planting along, uh, you know, along somewhere near those rocks where there might be some actual dirt? Uh, at this point, I think we, it's probably best to just let natural vegetation take over for this. Okay. Uh, in this point, I mean, again, uh, each each project is looked at through its own lens, so it's a, it's right. a, you know it depends on on the situation, the type the type of movement of the water in the creek. This is an area that that when it rains hard, comes up fast and goes down fast, and and the water comes ripping through here. So uh, there's a high velocity and a high scour uh, result right. of that. You're, you're the engineer. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll take a, a motion um, for um, uh, item B. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. For C, discussion on Montgomery County Recycling Consortium recommendations for processing, transfer station operations, and transportation of recyclable materials. And uh, Mr. Kuhl, I know this is a complicated issue and has been going on now for a couple of years. And uh, we've got a recommendation, even though it's probably with regret, right? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a shot at this. It's a lot of information. I did send uh, a good amount of it to you. Uh, there's probably still some more out there eventually that uh, everybody will see uh, once, you know, we get our heads on all of this. I got a pretty good uh, brief narrative for tonight. Um, I just want to start with the history a little bit. Uh, so for the last uh, seven years, we've been uh, working through our consortium transfer station, which is in uh, Upper Dublin Township on Fitzward Town Road. There's seven, seven municipalities that are all together in the consortium. Uh, we do have a pool of money, it's called capital money. It's sitting there that they use for certain improvements. Um, over the last uh, year, I guess the two years, we've been considering uh, getting a engineer to look over the whole process of that current site to see if there's ways to put out RFPs to multiple vendors to get bids on uh, either improving the site, uh, the processing, how we process, how we haul, how we operate. Uh, they were good, uh, currently running the site with three guys. Um, we weren't happy with what was going on. We were seeing a lot of delays, you know, one hour delays, uh, not enough trucking, um, trash, recycling all over the place issues with smells in the community over there. Uh, we, you know, pretty much begged JP Mascara to do a better job. They did step up, uh, change the machinery a little bit, tried to uh, speed up the time process. We still weren't happy with it. I felt like I was visiting that place probably once a week, um, just trying to stop in, take pictures and send it off to Upper Dublin to complain about things. I wasn't happy about it. Talked to other superintendents, they weren't happy. Long story short, uh, as a consortium, we decided to, um, like I said, get the engineers, consultants out there. Um, all seven municipalities participated. Upper Dublin Township did a transfer station operations assessment. 
which we all did the tech technical assistant uh, grants, which if you recall last year, we all applied for them. We were all awarded $5,000 that went towards this. We did have some uh, other minor funds that went towards it. I think maybe a total of $4,000 on top of the original five, bring it to like nine. Um, Hatboro Hatboro did the public education outreach for the recycling consortium. Springfield Township, their job was the dual stream recycling program considerations and costs. Cheltenham Township was responsible for the recycling market and processors review. Upper Moreland Township was in charge of the procurement considerations for transfer station operations, material hauling, material processes, processing and marketing. Abingdon Township was in charge of the preliminary materials recovery facility evaluation. Uh, all again, all this was done through the technical, uh, technical assistance grants. Um, what we have for consideration tonight is <clears throat> the current contract for JP Mascaro is set to expire April 21st. Um, after everything's been said, all the RFPs gone out, the biggest problem we had was there was only one vendor that would even put in a bid to run our transfer station. It was JP Mascara again. Uh, the biggest issue was, and what's going on in this world right now, is hauling costs. You know, the CDL drivers getting them to haul the material. Now, without having a secondary bid, uh, you know, their hauling costs, processing costs were high. Um, right now, currently, if we were to stay with them running consortium site as is, Per what they uh, put, a, put a bid on, the cost would be a 38% higher than where we are right now at the $140 a ton. Uh, would be, we'd be looking at like a rent, close to $193.93 per ton to take our material there. Now, when you think about that $193.93, we're not talking about that's actually what we're paying. That's the overall cost to process, haul, and operate. And that's not also including the 100% revenue we get back for the commodity. So some of you may know, but since September, we've been getting actually revenue back for our recycling, which is great. It's awesome. But prior to that, we weren't. We were paying a little money towards it again. Uh, some of the things that came out in the studies is that obviously there is a uh, big push for the bulk cardboard still. And I'll get to that in a little while. But, um, you know, whether the, whether the program is bundled or broken out, you're still looking at the same cost that J.P. Mascara is doing it. So the recommendation that I'm going to present tonight and Upper Dublin Township and Springfield's boards have already approved and signed for it. And this is what I would recommend for the current time is uh, that we would go with Republic. It's a, it's a cheaper seven year deal. It's $105 a ton. We would recommend that we would haul direct to the King of Prussia facility where we used to go when I was in my teens here working in the township. And uh, probably into my 20s, we were 20 and 30s, we were still hauling there. So it's not, we're not, it's not uncommon for us. It's a little farther than where we are now. Uh, it's right off of 202. It's, uh, we would be sharing 100% revenue share of all the commodities. Um, we'd be saving $35 a ton during the contract of the seven year with an option of a three, one year extension. At this point, we're not really even thinking about the three year extension because we're going to be looking to, um, apply for uh, grants, uh, you know, 902 grants are out there, Act 101 grants are out there. The 902 grants won't affect our regular 902 grants that we have for recycling. They said we could, those could be separated if we're going to use them for improving the um, consortium facility on uh, Fitzward Town Road. So Part of the problem was I was uh, part of the problem. I can't give you all the answers tonight, but I will make the recommendation still to go with Republic is there was a meeting last week for me to go to the Republic, talk about the bulk cardboard. You know, can we still get the bulk cardboard pricing? Because in the contract, it doesn't show that separation for bulk cardboard, but there could be ways for me to talk to the woman there. Her name's Andy Holt. And I'm going to meet her probably within the next week and find out about the bulk cardboard to see if we still have options to make good revenue on uh, bulk cardboard. But unfortunately, I had the COVID, so I couldn't go to that meeting last week, which I really wanted to. So I'm sort of out of the loophole on that, por on that portion. But 
Um, so the recommendation is seven year deal. I would say for the, I would ask for the commissioners to agree to do the seven year deal at $105 a ton. We haul to King of Prussia facility. It's about 25 minutes outside the township. Um, I'm going to meet with the Republic officials. We're going to talk about bulk cardboard. I can still get back to you on that. If that changes how we're going to operate, where we're going to haul to. Uh, currently, we were hauling um, to one of the sites in uh, Montgomeryville, but now that won't be an option going forward because of the contract change. On average, we're uh, taking in ten to $20,000 in revenue over the last couple months uh, through the whole consortium. You know, some of the things that are trending on a positive is there's a huge, huge demand for the bulk car cardboard deliveries throughout the state, county, and the whole planet from Amazon, UPS, FedEx, USPS, third parties. I mean, we all know it. it's here. Uh, major changes that we don't accept the Republic bid would be the pull out of the consortium if we want, try to go out on our own. The problem with that is once we go out, we can't get back in. You know, that that uh, that scares me with nowhere to go come uh, April. You know, there's been some uh, talks about, um, you know, could we do our own kind of transfer station within the township or somewhere close to? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, if nobody's seen my email, I put out, and I've been to those sites before, the smell's horrendous. The tracks, rodents, uh, bugs beyond belief because of the syrups and everything else and the food and that kind of stuff. I wouldn't recommend doing something where we are. I think the future is to uh, retrofit the current site at Upper Dublin and Abington where that chair is there, the township, you know, all the townships we keep applying for the 902s. And again, just to be clear, it doesn't affect our normal 902 grants, but keep on applying for them. Maybe we buy a couple of trailers, we do things, and then we look to hire our own haulers, whether it's in-house haulers through each municipality. We give up one guy, share guys to haul at some point in time. Uh, things that will change for us up front, uh, like I was saying before, 25 minutes is going to be a one-way trip. Uh, 15 minutes, longest wait, they're guaranteeing for us. Right now, we're sitting at an hour sometimes at the current facility where we hold because of the trailer, lack of trailers and all. There's a quicker turnaround time compared to, like I said, sitting for the one hour. Two tipping floors versus one tipping floor we'll be looking at. Uh, two scales versus one scale, that makes a big difference between moving your material in and out. We will be looking at a little more fuel cost, uh, fuel cost a little bit more maintenance. I don't see it being a big concern, Cavana, when we changed that, uh, was it six, seven years ago, uh, for our trash, we're right there in Plymouth meeting. This is only another about four miles past there. Uh, we didn't see any big challenges other than the winter time all in there. So I don't really see a big problem with there. Like I said, we used to haul there before. We hauled the same about, about, about the same amount of uh, recycled material, but not as much newspaper. Because obviously the newspaper is pretty much out of the stream for now. So uh, that would be my recommendation. Definitely want to open up for some questions if I can answer them. I mean, I said a lot of this information, there's so much information. There's over probably 100, 150 page information. I read it several times. I think I got a good, uh, good, good feel for what it is. It, it comes down to, you know, currently 140. You could go up to 193 where we stay at 105 for a guaranteed seven years with 100% of the revenue coming in from the commodities. We hope the commodities are gonna stay up. Obviously we know we can't guarantee that, but it is definitely shifting in the favor, especially when it comes to the cardboard, those kind of things I gotta work out. So I'll open up the questions for now. That's all I have, the information, and uh, let me hear your questions. Okay, let me, let me start out just asking you. So um, reconfirm two questions. First of all, reconfirm that the wear and tear, the fuel, and the time uh, from our department for this, you feel those are minimal compared to the Mascaro um, uh, excess pricing for the transfer station in the hall. The, those numbers work out in favor of this as well as the, the actual pricing. Yes, yeah, so there's a big offset okay. when it comes to when you look at like the hauling cost, uh, the hauling cost, what they were going to charge for us. Yeah, and I, I looked been, at that. Yeah, and that would have been for them hauling even to Republic. Right. If not even their okay. site saved money, it was just, it was, we would save more on the, on the other side. 
Okay. We don't, All right. Yeah, we don't see and that the, challenge being a big issue. Okay. The other question is if we were going to try to, as you say, retrofit the current transfer station, upgrade it, do whatever we wanted to, we really wouldn't be able to do that within a seven year contract with um, Republic, right? I mean, even if we wanted to do that, is the would the contract be flexible enough that we could do that? It doesn't sound like it. So is your question that, do you think that we could retrofit the current site within seven years? Is that what you're asking? Well, my, my question is if we're serious about wanting to go that route and still be using Republic, how, how, how would that fit in with a commitment to a seven year contract? Yeah, so I think, I think the answer, the goal is for us to retrofit the current site that we have to make it more manageable for all of us. The only people who are really going to benefit from this really good would be Plymouth Township because they're right around the corner from King of Prussia. The rest of the municipalities are all up here, you know, Upper Dublin, us, Springfield, we're right. over close, Upper Moreland. So, you know, part of the ideas were like uh, by purchasing a compactor and several trailers that have them on board. If you have those, then you only have to retrofit just part of the pad to receive that. And again, that goes back to who's going to operate it, which, you know, there's rumors out there that some of, some of the townships that are in the consortium are looking to potentially um, yep. retrofit it, you know? But what I'm, try what I'm trying to understand better is if we could do that within, say, the first three years, how does that impact? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think. Oh, so to answer your question, if you think that uh, we can retrofit within three years and then we'd be stuck with four more years. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen because there's a lot of, like I said, we have to all apply for the grants going forward. And uh, none of us feel that that's a possibility to happen within a couple of years. So we think the seven years gives us enough time to really work on how we're going to change that whole okay. uh, situation there. Okay, sorry. thank you. I missed your point the first time. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from the board. Uh, Commissioner Sigmund felt, yeah. Hey, Chris, is there any way that we could do a cooperative agreement with some of the other municipalities and share haulers? Uh, share haulers, I guess the question would be share haulers from what site? Yeah, from, I guess, I guess, you know, to go from site to site, but have an outside party represent yeah. the hauling. Yeah, so that's been those kind of things were brought up. And again, so you need somebody to run the consortium site. And right now, the only person who wants to do it is JP Mascara. Then, but the problem is it's not retrofitted right to still run the way it is to, uh, I guess, handle the amount of volume coming in from the consortium unless you have the extra trailers or compactors. Like right now, what they're using for compacting, the trucks back up this hill, they dump. Uh, into these trailers and they have a backhoe pretty much with a vibratory plate that pretty much depresses it packs your stuff you need yeah. something that you can dump into it's big and then it compacts with a compactor that you can put more material in to make it worth your while so instead of maybe sending three trailers a day maybe you don't have to send one because it's compacted more this backhoe is just not working what they have nor will it ever work for the the volume we're bringing in daily it's just not it's not happening We've looked at issues of, like, you know, trying to get them to bring more trailers and they're just not going to do it based on they can't get anybody to haul with the CDL issues right now in the world uh, sure. and the workforce. OK, so just a comment to the board. And that is, look, Republic is, a, you know, is a major company, probably just below waste management. They're an 11 billion dollar revenue company. So the truth is that I think that they're looking to expand this kind of business. And frankly, by doing these deals, you know, they're they're creating, you know, a bigger business for them in municipal in, in municipal waste hauling. So it seems to me that, you know, they're giving us a, a very interesting deal to be able to work on. Seven years seems a long period of time, but still at, at fixed numbers, it looks a hell of a lot more attractive than dealing with uh, than Mascaro, which is a much smaller, much regional, more regional company and doesn't have any kind of ability to do this kind of deal. So it seems to me there's a great value or benefit to that. Thanks, Chris. Um, Commissioner Norris and then Commissioner Arnold. Uh, Chris, 
Um, can you help me uh, uh, see where the numbers are coming from? I'm looking on page three or four. Um, it, it, is that where you're showing Republic Services at $105 per ton? Uh, three or four of what, what, what sheet are you talking which about? Which document? Yeah. Oh. I, have, I have like 10 of them on my table right now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah sorry. Uh, I, the first document in, in the attachment here. Um, there's, there's technical no. memoranda from technical memoranda. November. And yeah, from January. November 1st, technical memorandum. Oh, you know what? And let me ask my other question. Um, yeah. the, the total, what is our estimated total cost? Uh, what is our total cost this past year? Our cost, not the consortiums, but <coughs> what, what, we, what we had to pay. I do not have that information with me tonight. I can get that for you. Okay, do you know what the total cost is under the Republic plan estimated for the coming year then? Um, well, we, we won't know, again, we won't know <coughs> that because the commodity, the commodity can change at any moment. So we won't know that. I think there was a, uh, get, let me see if I can find it real quick. There was a annual revenue, oh, that's a revenue cost operations. Hold on for one second. Um, and he said also that we got rebates this year uh, in the last couple of months that we, we didn't did. get. So, so, so I guess in the high in the high market value of se between September 21st, there was uh, revenue expenses coming back to the consortium of $213,371. In the low market, in the low market, we were actually getting rebates or not rebates, but we were getting uh, cost rebates of one million seven hundred fifty dollars, seven hundred fifty thousand three hundred seventeen dollars, which is a big difference between the two hundred thirteen thousand. Right, but wouldn't the re wouldn't the rebates or the uh, the commodity pricing that we get back be the same whether it was Mascara or Republic? In other words, if if we said we're going yeah. to take one hundred percent, then yes, we'd that, get 100%. that is correct. Yes, okay. that's correct. But the hauling fees is where they're where they're killing us. JP Mascaro is trying to really hit it to to us on the hauling fees. That's where it becomes not right. profitable for us whatsoever. We actually lose big time based on their hauling costs. That's why I was asking what what are the hauling costs uh, estimated under Mascaro versus Republic, not per uh, ton, but on an annual cost. Uh, hold on for a minute. Let's see if I can find that for you real quick. There's so many things here. Well, another way of asking that is how many tons do we do a year? Well, we do 3,000, uh, 3,008 tons is the estimate on average we've been doing. Okay. And there's a 35, what you're saying is there's a $35 per ton differential. There's Mascara's a yeah. going to charge us at least 140. at least 140 they're, they're at 140 right now, and they're speculating that we were to stay with them and them operate the current transfer station because of hauling costs, depending on where they would take it to, whether it would be the Birdsboro, J.P. Mascara, or uh, Republic King of Prussia, it could go up to $193.93 per ton. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll defer yep. to Commissioner Armin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris, so d just to sort of um, break it down for, from my understanding, the, the, the way it will work is when a truck gets filled up, it then drives to Plymouth Meeting to dump the materials. Is that is that right? King of Prussia. King of Prussia, uh, King of Prussia excuse me. King of Prussia. Okay. And, and um, so how many, um, so how many trips would we anticipate that a truck would have to uh, go? And is it three, Anne? Um, in the in the outline, and I'm I couldn't I couldn't Chris, quite figure it out. In, but it, 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 there were at least two trips by two of the trucks, and one trip by the other truck, right? Yes. Yeah, so currently, right now, I'm sorry, I should have said it from the beginning when I was talking about the Mount Home. So currently, right now, we have two automated trucks and one Packer style truck. And at this moment, we're gonna keep that as it is for now mm -hmm. until I go to uh, Republic, talk to the woman, see if there's something else we need to do to change it. So we pick up cardboard different, whatever, we'll get to that. But right. so to answer the question would be the two automated trucks, they usually go to the dump twice a day. 
Got it. The Packer style truck, depending if he left someone from the day before, if it, if we don't usually send them if they only have a ton of recycling on. Mm-hmm. You know, re- recycling is not as combustible as trash is, so we don't worry about getting off the truck as much. So Got it. I would say on average, you're looking at two trips for the automated, one for the Packer style, the Packer style truck. And, and because it's a little bit of a lengthier trip, th- th- will that have any impact on the scheduling of um, pick up either for uh, trash or recycling in terms of your scheduling within the township and the, the geographic areas of, you know, who's on Monday, who's on Tuesday, that, that sort of thing. I don't think it will affect, it will, definitely won't affect the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday thing. You may see a change in the time. You're going to see these guys not getting done early. They're going to be get done later in the day because it's going to take them a little longer to go out. Uh, even though I said earlier that the other consortium site, they would sit there sometimes 45 minutes. Right. That's only two miles outside the township. You're talking 15 miles outside the township for this ride, but they might, but they can dump within 15 minutes because there's two scales, two tipping. So you know, it could, tipping. it could be a wash, you know, give or take depending. Okay. That, that, yeah. That's all, that, that's really what I was trying to get at is it, what would the, I understand the financials of it. Um, I, I think I understand the financials of it. That, I, what is the what was the practical impact? Is sort of what I was getting at, and, and from what I'm hearing from you, um, it 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 may you know on on one week it may take a little longer, one week it may take a little shorter, but but the impact to the residents should be minimal in that. That's sense. right. That, that's okay. correct. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Holland. You had your hand up also. Did thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have all the documentation in front of me, Chris, but um, can you speak to, I guess, the um, Republic's ability? Well, I guess I want to know how Republic is able to come in so much less uh, than JB Mascaro, and then um, over the life of the contract, speak to any uh, cost increases, or is this sort of a fixed? Uh, you know, cost over the over the seven year time frame. Okay, so I'll start with your second question. Your second question is yes, it's a fixed price <laughs> like that for the seven years, uh, for sure. Um, your first question. Repeat your first question again. Sure. Um, the the uh, the difference in in shipping costs. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. I got you. How, how are they able to do that? And then especially given that they're not looking to hedge for any increases over the next seven years. They're already coming in low and then they're not looking for any increase over the seven years when we know the costs are going to go yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I said earlier was, you know, they're in the game to recycle. They're in the game to make the money to get it there. They don't want to own, they don't want to operate a transfer station. They don't want nothing to do with they want you to bring it to them. They want to send it out the door. So how they get the number is by us hauling to them directly. They don't have to operate the current site like JP Mascara is doing. It's getting brought to them for the transportation. They have to hire drivers, their equipment, nothing like that. All they're doing is processing the material. That's it. And that's why they're giving us the better price with the 100% value of the commodity coming back to us. Where JP Mascaro, yeah, you can take it to them and you almost pretty much get the same price for direct haul and processing. However, you're going to Birdsboro, which is a little over an hour. Mm-hmm. for each truck one way and you're, you're going to be paying overtime every day to every truck because those guys are never going to get back till dark so mm-hmm. you know it, it, if you really put on a scale it's almost really close ton to ton if we want to go to birdsboro but that's not what we want to do we don't want to go an hour and 15 minutes out there it's crazy to do that i mean our trucks will be broken down in two years they'll be having so many miles on them. so you know monetarily wise efficiently wise to try to keep the same service with very low cost. You know, we're going to pay overtime sometimes when those guys get broken down or stuck, but it's going to be minimal compared to going to Burrsboro. So that, that's the reason why we're hauling direct to them. They're not operating nothing. And that's pretty much it. So, and and I, I probably shouldn't be asking this question, but how are they making their money if we're getting 100% of the, the revenue from the material? So because also J.P. Viscaro and Republic, what they do is they bump the processing cost up a little bit just so they get a little bit of money themselves, Got which it. I think okay. it did. Re- I think it did reflect in the one uh, page. I think it turned out to be like one hundred and sixty thousand dollars in processing costs a bump for both of them. It's even across the board. It's not like one sixty is one three twenty. It's one sixty is a flat Got rate. It. Period. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I got it. Thank okay. you. 
Okay, I have another question and that concerns the um, cleanliness of the materials that we're sending. Uh, do you know anything about the reputation of Republic versus what we've been doing? Um, are they able in our contract to um, penalize us or reject loads if they're not clean enough? Uh, are there other caveats that we haven't considered in terms of the, the quality of the material that we're uh, disposing of? Yeah, so I guess the answer to that question is just like we did with the JP Mascara contract, um, you know, there'd be times where we would say, hey, we want an audit of our recycling. And what you saw in the one report, right? We got our audit that gives you a composition of how many percentage of dirty comes out of your load. It's considered average or extreme. You know, we were right in the, you know, we were right in the average line, a little on the higher side, but not, not really bad, depending on, especially with the 3,000 tons per year we were bringing in, it looked pretty good. The problem is if you keep on saying, hey, I want to audit, I want to audit my stuff, well, the problem is if they audit it and then they say, you know what, yours is really dirty. They can at that point. Now, I haven't. That's a great question because I need to make sure of that. But in the other contracts, it was if, if you ask for an audit and they want to uh, go through each load that you bring in, then it's dirtier than they normally, uh, I guess, projected in the scope of the project. Well, then, yeah, you could be set at a higher rate. So pretty much at the hundred five dollars a ton, if you don't call for an audit you're staying there, you know? And that's something that I will double check on, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be the same as it was in the last one, which is the reason why we never did it that much. We only did that one time towards the end because we knew we were getting out of the contract and we were looking for ways to improve. But we found out that ours wasn't really that bad overall compared to any other municipality. We were right in line with what we would call the dirty load, you know? Okay, so we just, I don't want any surprises on that. Uh, and rejection of our loads. Uh, Commissioner Brockington. Hey, hey, Chris, just for the residents, describe a dirty load. Sure. Uh, so in, in the audit process, a dirty load is a truck full of garden hoses, broken glass, you know, all the things you're not supposed to recycle, bricks, cement, <laughs> You know, one of the biggest challenges uh, that I've heard from J.P. Mascaro and Republic is that, you know, when you change the program from when I first started, we used to take every piece of bottle and glass and you would separate into a bin. And all you brought up was separated colors. But we were also using a golf, golf club to break them into pieces while you're hanging on the back of the truck and glass was shooting your eye in your face. You can't do those kind of things these days, you know. Um, so, but the point is, my, my whole point is, with these cans, these carts, we call them, with the lid on it and the automated trucks, yeah, the automated truck sounds good. You, sa you save some manpower, but the other side of it is you don't see what's going in it. The arm takes it up in the air, dumps it, and that's it. What we're seeing is well, the dirty load, and I'm not speaking of the Cheltenham Township residents. I think we do the best out of every township according to what you have seen in those papers. You see the amount of tonnage and what it is. We do really very well with our recyclables, but some of these people are putting dirt, rocks, their trash cans full. It's only one small bag of trash. And I go, eh, I'll just throw it into the recycling. Who's gonna know? And it's truth, we, won't, we don't know, but that becomes a dirty load, right? So it goes up there, that's part of your dirty load. They're not, they're not calculating those trucks at the, at the moment because they didn't do an audit. So it just goes through the machinery. They have air compressed air. And I think I talked on this before months ago, it's really neat that it goes across the belts, the air blows the trash out of the recyclables because there's weight variables and everything, which is pretty neat to see. The trash is separated, the metals are separated, the garden hoses are separated, you know, everything's separated down to the, to the nitty gritty. So, you know, it's all about recycling, doing the right thing. I don't even have an update on Republic yet as far as like, you know, once this contract's done, I'm assuming we'll get a lot of, uh, paperwork, a lot of social media stuff to share with the residents, what they're going to take more and more, more than JP Mascara took. Uh, you know, maybe we can add more things to our recycling. Maybe they'll tell us to take more things out of our recycling and put it more in trash because they don't find any value in it. You know, those are the kind of things that we're going to find out once this contract is completely done. I'm assuming that, uh, I'm not going to assume that's not a good thing to do. 
Um, but I would hope to see more things being added to the recycling going forward. I've heard a lot of good things of uh, new things coming that we can add into recycling. I'm hoping that continues. But yeah, dirty is, you know, if your trash can's full, you don't throw the extra into the recycling can. That That's what the biggest problem is throughout the whole entire county and state with these uh, recycling carts and even the trash carts, you know, or cabana, you know, people are doing their garden. They got five shovelfuls of dirt left. They don't know how to get rid of it. And they just throw it into their trash can. The trash can, the automated ones dump it right into the back of the truck. Nobody sees it. They go up to Cabana and you can't burn dirt. So eventually there's ash and all this dirt that has to go in. Somebody's paying for it. And it's the, you know, all the townships. So, you know, th there's the, the negative, I guess you would say, in the consortium. If you're going with everybody, we all pay. If we do our own. Well, we better have our own facility where we're processing everything ourselves, which I don't see us be able to do at this point in time. So that, that is the answer. And hopefully I did answer everything when it comes to dirty litter. So I, where we stand right now, we don't have, we have a price quote. We have that, but we don't really have the contract, do we? You're not actually asking us to approve the contract? Or are you? No, I'm asking you to approve us to enter into a contract with Republic for a seven-year deal at $105 a ton with 100% of the revenue share back from the commodities to us, which is, okay, a cost so which is a cost savings of $35 a ton right now, if we were even to stay where we're at, but that's, the, that's not going to happen at $140. It's going to go to the $193 because of hauling costs and everything else, and we're still back in the same situation with no improvements to our current site. Matt, Madam Chairwoman, if I can. Please, go ahead. We would, we would want to see the contract before right. we would put that in front of you. I think what Chris is asking for is to go to the process to get that agreement done and then bring that back okay. for review to make sure there's no hidden clauses in there. That and that, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, that, yes. um, I would like to put forth a motion to go ahead and approve the um, development of this contract so that we can see it and uh, review the, the fine details. And, and uh, with thanks, because we know this has been very labor intensive and it's been going on for a couple of years now. So. Yeah, I'd just, uh, like to, I'd just like to rec uh, commend Chris. He's done a lot yeah, on this and absolutely. really followed through. So. And, and if, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, yes. Because we're going through this uh, potential change, um, I think it's probably, and Chris, I know you do this every once in a while, I think it's probably also a good time to get the message out to the community about what is recyclable, what should be going in the recycling cart, what shouldn't. Um, you know, it's one of these things that that I know you do and, and we should all be paying attention, but it's good to get those reminders and, and because we're changing uh, the process, this may be a good time to do that too. And actually the questions continue to come yeah. from the residents in every context we keep hearing, we're confused. So we know it's a, a moving target. So I, you know, I think that is a constant. Yeah, so, so I would totally agree with you. And I think part of that was with the website improvements once that gets up. We can start doing like video kind of things where I would go out, show a do's and don'ts at the curbside, those kind of things. And uh, if everybody didn't know, Bob volunteered to be the mascot, the recycling mascot for the township. So we're working awesome. on the costume right now. We're going to do and have a mascot out there. So I just want to put that to the board. It can't be gritty. It has to be the, a blue cart guy. <laughs> are, you, are you saying we, we got a re, are you saying we got a recycled township manager? <laughs> you can do that too. <laughs> um, it's a good time that you brought this up uh, because with our spring newsletter, it would be the ideal time to be able to get that out to every home um, and just publicize that. Yeah. And I, I think once we see the contract, once I go out there to Republic, I talk to the, the big boss there, I can get that kind of material what they're, uh, you know, what they're going to add into it, what they really don't want. Like we had the dirty dozen right now for the <laughs> JP Mascaro. Maybe we'll have the 30 something through, uh, you know, the Republic. So, and then the mascot idea will be great. So, you know. Yeah, 
I, I like that idea, patient on the blue card. All right, so <clears throat> we have uh, before us um, uh, the entering uh, motion to enter into a contract that will then come back to us with the consortium. I so move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Any you, opposed? everybody. Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Okay, item uh, D, uh, 4D, discussion of water issues at Curtis Hall. What's that one? That would be me. Um, bear with me, my voice leaves me at eight o'clock. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so we received um, an email from Jeff Miller Catering um, saying that they're continuing to have water issues in the basement of Curtis Hall. Um, over the years since we've entered into the contract with them, they've done a number of things uh, to try to ameliorate that issue. Um, Jeff Miller himself and his team has also done some work um, to ameliorate the issues. Um, as you're aware, we've done roof and masonry repairs, um, but we've also talked to a number of people about potential to need to do some more substantial um, basement waterproofing ish, um, repairs. Um, it might be time that we, we do look into that. Um, it is, it's a, when we've talked to a number of people, we can't exactly determine where the water is coming from, um, even when it seems like it should be obvious, but it's not. Um, but it does seem like it is coming you know, from certain areas um, below the ground at this point that that's affecting um, the basement. Um, Jeff Miller's team have had to replace drywall and, and things like that throughout the, the last year or so. Um, we have included money in the capital budget to do that, um, but we are bringing this before you just for the discussion um, with the um, goal that we would go out and talk to various uh, vendors to put some proposals together and see what it would really truly take and cost to do this work. Since we don't know where the water is coming from, might we need uh, a forensic uh, engineer or uh, some kind of serious underground uh, survey of what we're on? We saw, you know, when, when we were doing the, the stairways, we know that uh, some of this was built on, shall I say, trash. Um, so uh, that didn't give us a whole lot of confidence in the... Uh, uh, the underground footings, perhaps. Um, Agreed. So, uh, I mean, I think we really do need a hydrology kind of specialist. Um, is that is that the kind of recommendation you're making? Yeah, it's it's really to kind of talk to like get um, start the process of finding the right professional to help us establish the, the right fix. Um, one of the places I might start with um, is with our engineer. They do have um, a team that seems to be able to, to take a look at these types of situations, um, structural engineers, architectural engineers, that type of thing. Um, we also, um, the other issue, and Alan Brown is on this uh, meeting as well, is um, the need to look at our HVAC system and, re and replace that as well, upgrade it. So um, again, if funding um, does has a, have a type of team, uh, oh, I see Roger still on the, on the call as well. Um, so we are talking with them or um, I've talked to a number of other people um, to that, that could also help guide us in the right direction as well. Okay, uh, Commissioner Norris. Um, I'm assuming or hopeful that there are government grants available for a historic structure such as Curtis Hall. Would that be part of yeah. our plan? Is that reasonable? Um, unfortunately, historic uh, grants are not what they used to be. Um, they, we have applied for a number of them and we've been kind of like trying to work some non-historic grants um, to kind of tweak them to fit into that situation. Um, and I'm not sure that, that, that we would be able to find grants for this. Mm. Uh, then perhaps I'm going to uh, ask uh, 
uh, Commissioner Zygmuntfeld, if if this isn't already on one of our project lists for uh, seeking out government assistance, we should add it. I'm looking. I believe we did include um, Curtis, and but I'm not quite sure if it was the building itself. What I do, oh, yeah, uh, there is there is uh, some activity related to Curtis Arboretum both the meadow, the Rock Creek Greenway, et cetera. Um, this is and the it's building a fairly itself. sizable, it's about an $800,000, $900,000 investment. But what I will recall is that Boucher and James oversaw putting in a, a number of underground pipes to try and control the water flow. And the first thing that happened was the I believe the pipe widths were inadequate so that as soon as they installed them, there was backup that was occurring and the surcharge was creating flooding in the area. And I don't think that was ever remedied under the, uh, under the original issue that quote unquote Bouget and James was supposed to properly engineer. Um, Mitch, Mitch, I think you're correct to a point of, there are gr numerous grading issues there that are inadequate. And especially in area I know Chris pointed out is there's a drain in the ground that water is doesn't get there. I, it probably runs dry the entire time. So I think there's also work that's gonna to need to be done around the building a little further away. Yeah, I mean, that, that may be the case. However, a lot of these water issues did predate uh, the Jeffrey Miller um, projects. So, um, and they are, they do have to do with the building itself. As Ann alluded to, um, there's a spot in the, closet where it's kind of in the front of the building under the circle. Um, we've looked into that and there's areas where there's voids in between the walls where the water just it just finds its way in um, and it's been finding its way in for, for years and years. And um, as uh, one of the architects we've worked with has said that you fix a problem in the building and there's so many other voids in the building, but they, it just finds other ways to get, get in, in there. So. There may be another solution here because um, in our recent discussion with the Army Corps of Engineers, they talked about helping us with, with sources of problems in terms of establishing feasibility. And in basin number six, which is Curtis, there's a collection of water from Eastern Road, Oak on Savino, the Tower, Cedarbrook and Wingate, and they all kind of coalesce into the area near Curtis. So part of what we should do as part of our follow-up with the Army Corps is to ask them to do that feasibility investigation and talk to us about how they can both fund um, that portion of it and then talk to both DEP and PennDOT about remedying it. Because if in fact the Army Corps identifies that as the source, then there are options for us to tap into some of the additional funds. So that was something that we actually had a discussion about last week. Mm, I, it's, I'm not quite sure, because um, it sits kind of high. I'm not sure that it's actual actual site water. It's, it's more from the building itself that's causing these issues. I'm not positive, but I'm, I mean, I think the Army Corps will definitely do the investigation piece. So what is the, um, other than information, purposes right now, um, what is the to-do uh, uh, agenda here? Yeah, like I said, um, we would like to just kind of go out and, and um, talk to various uh, consultants and try to come up with uh, a solution um, and get some costs for you um, and bring them back in the next, probably take a couple months to, to get that worked out. But um, like I said, it, it might be a pretty extensive project and we did budget money um, in the budget for, for uh, capital improvements and repairs to the building. But uh, so essentially we are, are informed now and you all are gonna bring us back additional information. You don't Correct. need additional uh, action from us at this time. Correct. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you very much. So that was D on, um, a uh, new business. I have actually another item of new business to present tonight. Sorry to make this a lengthier evening than, uh, than it started out. Uh, uh, many of us are, are 
have become aware just in the last few days of um, a proposal from the court system in the state and the county to eliminate the magisterial um, court that is currently um, under the uh, jurisdiction of Judge McHugh when she retires in the uh, eastern part of the township. And I want to just give us a little bit of background uh, because there's some action being taken uh, by some of uh, uh, the folks. And, and the question really for us is, uh, is this detrimental to Cheltenham Township uh, if it takes effect in, in 2023? We have a very limited um, time frame for public comment. The public comment period apparently is only 30 days and it ends at the end of January. So we're already almost there. Um, every, and, and apparently some of this was raised at uh, a meeting on Monday night. I wasn't there to hear it. I, I've since uh, read the materials on the county website under the courts. Um, I've spoken with Representative um, Napoleon Nelson, uh, spoken with Judge, Judge Sersky about it. So the, the idea is that every 10 years, the county, uh, the, uh, well, the county, the state uh, judicial system does reevaluate the court boundaries and workloads and things like that. Um, so th they are, you know, taking advantage of this potential retirement to reduce the courts available to our caseload. And essentially they would all, all of Cheltenham's court, uh, the cases would be then uh, moved to Judge Sersky's court. And although he, he acknowledges that he will, assuming he's reelected, that he will work with whatever workload he is required to do, the concerns by both the representative and uh, him and others who have contacted me is that the workload will increase, the time pressure on those cases will increase. Um, the other kinds of concerns that our judges do when they are processing these, some of the pre-trial, some of the um, restorative justice uh, and assistance that uh, is given to people who come before the court. Some of those uh, preventive and anti-recidivism kinds of activities will thereby be reduced when you get that much pressure. There's also a concern that um, frankly, this discounts the nature of the things that appear before our magistrates, <clears throat> particularly because of our presence with Cheltenham Avenue and the kinds of, we, we talked in public safety about the increase in violent crime along uh, that corridor. Um, it doesn't take into account that some of the uh, reduction in some of the services is because of COVID. And if we're talking about planning for the next 10 years, it discounts other changes to our population, to our um, caseload, the, the nature of our caseload. Bottom line, uh, real quick, um, is that there is this opportunity for public comment um, uh, Representative Nelson has drafted a letter to the um, court administrator, who is the person who's receiving public input. Um, I would recommend that this board uh, go along with that model of opposition to this change and write a letter um, explaining that we feel that uh, Cheltenham Township will be harmed 
especially our, our minority populations, uh, our, our poverty, our density, all of the various things that make our situation very different from those in some of the other suburbs in Montgomery County. So um, I would recommend that we as a board make that kind of statement and send it in. Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Pransky. Thank you. Um, I, this is the first I heard of this, so I'm trying to fill in some blanks for myself. Sure. Um, this directive, this whatever you want to call it, came from the state assembly? It's mandated by, it, it's sort of a, a mandate and the state does this and it does it through the county courts. I believe so, it's done, I believe it's done by the Commonwealth Court, if I'm not okay, mistaken. Okay, sorry, thank yeah. you. Yeah, why don't you take over answering these? Uh, no. <laughs> because, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I could- I don't pretend to be an expert on I, this. I don't know that I could answer, but I, in, in that particular one, I think the, the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania is tasked with reviewing the, um, the uh, lo local courts and uh, you know, whether they should be consolidated, continued as is, and they do it on a, uh, a, a every 10 year basis. All right, so there are some sort of parameters, I, I assume, and I'm not, you're not the you know, answerer on these things, but there's some sort of parameters that say, oh, well, this is falling below a certain level, so maybe we can close that court down, or um, what I'm trying to figure out, and just work yeah, with you for a second, is, this also a political issue to remove the Democratic judge from the court system um, because that was a big move by the Republican Party in the last couple of years on local levels. Um, and how much of this is under our purview in that it's in our township? Um, and we would obviously be the best judge of what caseloads and requirements are here. Um, because if this just gets handed off, no matter what the comments are to someone who's already made up their mind, it leaves us with little option. So I'm really trying to understand the process here because given everything that Ann said, and we all know the realities of the township, I think it would be a mistake to close the court down, but I'm trying to understand process here. So the county, I, I'll start and then Matt jump in, please. The county website under their courts, and I can give you the, the act actual email uh, or the, the uh, website is montcopa.org forward slash 285 forward slash county hyphen courts. They have all those things spelled out, the numbers, uh, the, the workload and stuff like that. Um, I, and uh, in the representative's letter, he actually talks in specifics to some of those criteria. Um, but indeed, I was informed that the uh, judges uh, who, who actually did this, um, well, I will just say that it was issued from uh, Thomas Del Ricci and Carolyn Carluccio. So, those are the judges who, uh, uh, under whom the the, uh, the draft proposal, uh, it's under their their signatures. So uh, you can you can make your determination about whether it's a political uh, decision or not. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the politics of it, but but. Um... The, the, or I won't speak to the politics of it, the, <laughs> but the, but the, uh, um, and, and there are criteria. I think in this particular case, the decision uh, may have been made easier by the retirement of the incumbent judge. Um, and in, in my personal view, that should not be a basis for shutting down a court. Um, and, uh, as with many regulatory matters that are decided administratively, um, typically there is a comment period. Uh, what weight the um, sort of administrative body that decides these things gives to the comments um, is probably up for debate. But um, if we feel strongly about it, um, I think it's worth 
thro throwing our uh, throwing our hat in, uh, in the ring on on one side or the other. Um, I don't think there's any harm in it necessarily. Um, my, my concern, as Commissioner Rappaport had suggested, is not necessarily that um, not necessarily that. Well, I have to go to the, this side of the township to get to court as opposed to that, although that may be an issue for for um, some of our population. Um, the, the, the bigger issue is the workload and and how that impacts in terms of the ju the judge's ability to um, dispense justice, but but also in delays, um, postponements. Uh, and uh, a level of frustration and a lack of confidence in our local court system. So it still affects public safety also. Sure. Absolutely. There's no question about that. My, my only other question, Mitch, and then I'll, I'll let go of it. Um, given they make a decision that we're averse to, is there a process to appeal, to sue the court, to do something to make it reconsidered at a different level? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I assume there's, I mean, if we wanted to be litigious, I'm sure we could, we could file something in court, but that would probably be a question for our solicitor. Yeah. Yeah, I'll good. add uh, the list that we, we've been developing. The other one is the actual scheduling of a single court. You know, I mentioned the docket, but it's also a, a, a situation for, um, for our residents and for those people needing the court system, because scheduling becomes a real issue when you have as many cases coming into one court as opposed to multiple courts and multiple staffs. So they're not really going to be saving, you know, and I, as I say, I spoke with uh, Judge Sersky. I haven't had a chance to speak with uh, Judge McHugh yet, but and he's going to be writing uh, a letter of opposition as well. But, but it is an issue of uh, how it impacts um, the people he is actually going to be seeing. And it also does not save as much money as perhaps the court system is hoping to because he'll still need an equivalent or more staffing to process. Otherwise, it's justice delayed. So, you know, either way, it's it's not a good picture. Mitch's hand got tired. He was on the stage. Oh, oh I'm let's... sorry. I'm sorry. Right. Go right ahead. So two comments. You know, I don't know about Napoleon's politics here, but Emmett Madden wants to be the, 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 you know, his agenda is he wants to become the successor judge and he wants to keep the Jenkintown related location. So the awareness that came to my, across my desk came from somebody who was advocating for R. Emmett Madden, who has his own law firm in Jenkintown. So there is some political chicanery going on, whether it's through our auspices or through the Jenkintown folks. But I think we need a point of view from both Betty and Chris Searski that tell us what the workload is. And the fact is that if Cheltenham still has the presence of a second judge and they, rec they recommend that we need that resource, then we shouldn't give it up. And it should be our decision who is the person put into that position who could potentially succeed Betty McHugh. <clears throat> so, you know, I don't want this to become a political game. I think it needs to be what do we need from a jurisdiction standpoint and from a legal coverage standpoint? Is Chris overworked? If he is or if Betty and Chris both feel like they need it. And then the other thing is we should be the ones to serve up candidates and not have it become a political football. Uh, Judge, Judge Sersky definitely said that he will do whatever is required, uh, but he does feel that the impact will be adverse to, to the, uh, you know, another example uh, that was given was that uh, in Judge McHugh's uh, court, they do a lot with the students at the high school and other, other students in terms of restorative justice and other preventive kinds of programs uh, to keep the pipeline uh, from, from being there basically uh, to, to, from, from school to prison. So um, that would be jeopardized. And that is one of the concerns that kind of 
processing uh, and the time it takes to work with people who come to the pool. So, uh, and I'm being repetitive, but he, he has uh, stated and said it was fine to express his, his opposition here tonight. I would be curious personally uh, as to other townships in the area, both those of those dominated by one party as opposed to the other with their general population total and the number of courts and judges they have available to them. Because given our population and population density, I would bet if there is a judge in the Jenkintown area, you know, that only has to cover the population of Jenkintown versus Cheltenham, which has got, what, twice, three times their population. Um, and I think it would be in that case easier to make the case for workload and population. Um, and, and yes, Mitch, keep the arguments objective, but I think the political thing is there, whether we like it or not, it's, it's there. And what we have to do is know the ways to deal with that if it becomes the deciding issue. Well, as I say, the numbers are on the website. You can weigh them. Uh, it, the problem in and Montgomery County does have, uh, I mean, they're talking about categorizing 2A and all these other uh, different uh, criteria that they use. The, the thing that's distinguishing, again, is that just those numbers are not adequate to actually understand the issue of the justice rendered and the kind of dockets that are faced in Cheltenham versus had or uh, uh, you know, so, some other Lansdale, wherever you want. They're not equivalent. And so the question is, do we go to bat for uh, this? We have a very limited amount of time. We can maybe authorize more research or something to happen between now and next week. Um, I personally am going to go ahead and, and send a letter of opposition whether or not this board chooses to act. But uh, I think it would make a lot more uh, difference uh, if a number of different organizations um, uh, express themselves during the public uh, comment period. I would want to make a motion to write. I'm sorry, Matt. I saw, I saw you take a breath and I jumped on. Um, to write such a letter uh, in opposition. But I would also want to suggest that in line with what you were just saying, Ann, that for instance, our police department uh, and other agencies within the township and within the area also write letters as a body uh, in opposition of the concept. Um, let's face it, I think the, the police know probably better than, than all of us, how many people they have to take to the court system. Hmm? I'm sorry. I, I, would, yeah. I would imagine DA's office is, t is taking a position as well. I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine they are. But I think I think we should arm ourselves with as many things as we can and pretty much flood them with the uh, what the hell are you thinking? I, I would not be opposed to, um, um, you know, staff or Commissioner Rappaport, if you want take a cr crack at a letter and, 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 um, and, you know, circulating it for, for review, um, uh, with, with staff's assistance. I, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to exploring that. But do you want it to sound intellectual I mean, or angry? Cause she can write an intellectual one and Mitch can write an angry one. So, I mean, it depends how you want to sound. I didn't mean to volunteer anyone. I was just. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you, uh, are you wishing yourself out of that loop? I'll be I'll be happy to weigh in. How's that? Okay, fair enough. All right. Um, I'll be happy to read the scale when he gets his weight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Township Manager, did you want to make any comment on this before we uh, take a vote, or anybody no. else? Okay. Uh, so there is a motion to at least try a draft. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, we're getting there, guys. Uh, we're at old business for public affairs. Anybody? When's the next facilities meeting? Come on, Do we Dan. have one yet? We'll be scheduling that probably uh, early February. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I just want to thank you for bringing that last item to our attention. I was, I for one was not aware of that whole situation with the board. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any announcements like the Lime Kiln Pine uh, Pike Bridge or anything? Well, there, there, <laughs> there is going to be another closure, but but I'm going to wait till next Did week. Save so, that. Okay. So, so it's well, a little you know. closer. Okay. Uh, but yes. Uh, okay. Uh, citizens Forum. I don't think we have any citizens here. Um, okay. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>